Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the nice introduction. Uh, Professor Sampat Thomas Singer, you chairman UGC. Professor Janita Alienagi, uh, the ch general chair of uh, SLAS and the vice chairman of UGC. Professor uh, Rangika Halwatura, the commissioner of uh, uh, Indian Press Club. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, first of all, let me thank the organizers who has been uh, you know, chasing me behind for this presentation for the last couple of uh, weeks. Uh, I wasn't you know, planning to come to Colombo and I hardly found my shoes this morning uh, because this is after a long time I ca came out of Peradenia uh, to deliver something like this. Uh, we have been you know, talking to computers for last so many months. Uh, so I was thinking, okay, what should I, okay, how, I don't know how, what happened to my slides. Uh, uh, let me, maybe after it puts on this one, maybe something happened. Okay. Uh, I was thinking, what should I talk to this audience? Because I'm a, you know, I'm, if I go and talk in a triple E audience, uh, I know that I must talk more in uh, power related, renewable energy related stuff. But here we have SLAS, we have uh, Indian Desk Commission, we have IEEE. So I was thinking, where should I pitch my talk? And I'm fortunate that I'm just following uh, uh, our UGC chairman because he has made some uh, remarkable connections for my presentation to go on. Uh, so I. I I'm going to talk about the artificial intelligence based innovations for forecasting and control of COVID-19. Uh, uh, as uh, you heard that I'm attached to Peradin University. Uh, been there for a little while now. Uh, but uh, this is very recently only we started move on on to this particular topic but artificial intelligence wasn't new we have been applying artificial intelligence to many other areas so i'm going to mix with my present work as well as my former work when i go through and for the benefits of the the young members and the non um, familiar members of artificial intelligence i thought of i will pitch it in a slightly lower uh, level. So I will give an introduction to AI techniques, uh, why AI now and our research on COVID AI and uh, recently acquired GA grant from uh, IDRC Canada. I'm sure you all can remember this uh, uh, machine versus man, uh, Gary Kaspersos versus Deep Blue. Uh, this was uh, this happened in 1997. Uh, I could remember that uh, you know there was a fairly good publicity was given because uh, Gary Kaspersko was uh, you know with uh, some Russian origin, whereas uh, IBM is uh, Western origin. So they wanted to show that uh, you know the the Western brains are winning. And end of the day, uh, of course. Uh, uh, the computer won two games against this man. He was the champion that time. And then, you know, what one, one might think, okay, how comes that computer beat him? Computer ha doesn't have any intelligence in it. Of course, it's not the intelligence of the computer. The Deep Blue was developed by a team of IBM experts together with some chess masters. So what they did was they converted the knowledge in these experts into thousands and thousands of rules. And these rules were running in a computer. So it's not the knowledge running in a computer, it was the rules which were running in the... So that is where we call these rule-based examples. And I, I thought that I will take an example for, from my own field to introduce you the rule-based AI. Uh, this, what you are seeing here is what we call a DC microgrid. Now it's Pathetic to see that uh, today we generate electricity and, uh, you know, you, using uh, two types of sources. One is uh, AC sources like our coal power plants, hydropower plants and so on. 
at the same time we are now seeing huge addition of solar pv uh, if the, uh, the the cb is now working on the new plan according to the government 70% requirement and the cb uh, according to the cb plan 1000 megawatt of solar pv will be available on, on uh, our system by 2022 in two years time uh, now solar pv generate dc then what we do we convert this dc into ac and bring it along the wires and then bring it to these buildings and we use these led lamps and this one is not led these are still old lamps but we use led lamps which are dc again so you convert dc into ac and then invert uh, sorry you invert dc into ac and then convert ac into dc two conversion stages unnecessary losses so what we thought why not directly use dc solar in the, with dc loads when you look at many loads today our air conditioners are dc even though they are connected to ac they are invert operated dc devices our led lamps are dc all these computers are dc that's why it comes with the box the box is there to convert and that box if you touch it it's heat so it is just wasting energy every time so we had, we developed this uh, system we de and also we we were supported by sustainable energy authority uh, we uh, managed to so show that this is an ideal system for many commercial buildings like uh, banks if you look at banks today their load is predominantly dc they have lights they have acs they have computers they do they may have occasionally a kettle but the the bank why they wanted to run on dc the ac they can run on dc and we showed that you can get an enormous energy improvement but the problem is running a system like this remember your load is varying your solar power varies with the clouds solar power varies over the day so uh, we need to to make sure that the energy balance is maintained every single second and also remember your battery cannot be drained out below 20 percent of its charge you cannot charge the battery above its 100 percent charging capacity so we need to think about the energy management system and then we develop an energy management system but remember you cannot work with the the current reading so we need some prediction so we uh, take the time step t predict what's going to happen in next time step and we schedule things accordingly and for that we develop what we call a rule based energy management system and you can see that we have come up with four modes export parity mode where we have excess energy on our dc microgrid so we can ex export the energy to the grid we came up with import priority mode where we don't have enough energy so we need to import energy we have uh, energy storage priority mode where we are go where the price of electricity out there is expensive it's better to consume electricity from your own battery so we came up with that and finally the demand priority mode so and for each of these mode we develop many other rules and all these rules went into a microprocessor and microprocessor basically decide which one what to do at every single time step so these are what we call the rule based systems and uh, we we developed this uh, system it's up and running but of course we could not apply this to any uh, you know real system and run the case here maybe you know something that we need to look at uh, for the sake of future so what, what this rule based system does it's basically con convert the knowledge inside humans using traditional software uh, into a computer and you then use your inputs and come up with desired outputs but today we call ai something which uh, a machine which can think better than this and those are called machine learning ai now in machine learning AI, what we do is we have 
we use set of data remember the data is the training data is the most important thing in uh, uh, machine learning ai you need a good set of data to train your system once it is been trained then it can take an input and give you an output let me come to an example straight away where okay before going into extra example now this ai was there for you know long time one of the key papers which people might say uh, the you know the kind of emergence of machine learning ai was the this paper by uh, am turner the computing machinery and intelligence published in 1950 but when we were young or when we were doing uh, our engineering um, ai wasn't in the mainstream uh, you know nobody was talking about ai but if you talk to somebody today you know ai has become a common language today everybody is talking about it why why people are so uh, keen to talk about ai now one main reason is the massive data that is available as everybody is telling covid is a data driven pandemic you have enough data now unfortunately even though we have enough data in sri lanka there is a tendency that people doesn't like to give data now in that is because of that reason i we are doing our research based on the uh, data coming from uh, john hopkins hospital in uh, us they have everything or in open public i have written to every single mah office to help ministry still waiting for a reply still not got any reply from our uh, colleagues so I, i mean some people think that these data i mean i know that even you know i have the very good contact with cb getting the data from cb also difficult if i i ask somebody in cb certain hinda denna but that's not kind of you know thing that that has to be the case it should be open to the public so public can come up or not not the public at least the researchers researchers can come up with innovative ideas so here you can very clearly see what has happened in us you can see the the, the this uh, epidemiological curves that we developed this is the death per 100k people and you can see that states the which are highly dense states had the first peak the blue curve and the blue uh, uh, states in the us then the the bottom uh, the, the you know the texas and the, the states which are closer to the south america became the second peak now comes the third peak which is the the middle of the country iowa tech, uh, you know that kind of the, so you can predict what's going on in a country i mean we are slightly seen that okay there was a huge uh, boom of uh, covid uh, cases in uh, Gampaha then came to Colombo. Now we can start seeing few more in Kandy. So it's kind of you know if you have data, we can predict things. But unfortunately, uh, you know as I told you, we are a little restricted with that uh, luxury. Then the second reason why we are talking about AI is the increasing computing power. Now remember that the the human brain has ten ten to the eleven neurons with uh, you know and that can do. They are not like you know they are not operating like a computer, so you cannot really compare as a you know the floating point uh, operations of a computer or something. But they can do ten to the seventeen operations per second, whereas our normal computer can do today like four to five, uh, ten into ten to the nine operations per second. there is one computer which is uh, which is uh, considered as the fastest computer in the world which is the k computer in developed by japan uh, which has almost come closer to us 10 to the 16 operations per second but they have massive parallelism i'll show you in the next slide how much cost they have so in peradenia the 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 best computer that we have is uh, 256 gigabit of ram and 32 cpu cores that is what we have at peradeni they you can see how much the k computer has the uh, it is uh, uh, 1400 terabytes of ram and 7500 
सॉरी सेवन हंड्रेड फाइव थाउजेंड ट्वेंटी फोर सी पी यू कोर्स सो हाउ मेनी पैरल कंप्यूटर्स आर दे आर टू अचीव दैट स्पीड नाउ द गूगल ऑफर्स रिसर्च क्रेडिट्स एंड सर द यू जी सी दू कैन इंटरवीन बिकॉज द श्रीलंका कैनॉट गेट गूगल क्रेडिट श्रीलंकन रिसर्चर्स कैनॉट गेट गूगल क्रेडिट आई डोंट नो वाई uh so if we can see and you know the the if you, you just get into that edu google com programs uh, credits research you should be able to get google credit and access their computer which is 1400 gigabyte of ram and 224 cpu cores unfortunately we cannot uh, access that database uh, sorry that particular cloud facility uh, but remember you cannot access all that cloud facility it's all depend on how much credit you have uh, i mean if you have money you can uh, get more so what we you as the typical way we were trying to uh, get you know all our researchers pulled into this but uh, you know it didn't work uh, so uh, that is something i think we should look at it then uh, the the third reason why ai is becoming uh, common today is the improved machine learning algorithms now uh, there are broad families of machine learning algorithms you can you know if you talk to a ai expert you will ha- half the way you will lost yourself where they will talk about all kind of algorithms uh, which are beyond your capabilities but remember there are uh the everything is depending on your training data there are label data as you are seen from your uh if you are looking at uh, your left hand side you have label data and you have unlabeled data as you in your right hand side let me show you a ai application uh, now this one is called supervised learning application where you have data some sorry label data now what we did was uh, now what one of the things which, which is happening in the world with the lot of renewable being added into systems uh, now for example if sri lanka is going to go with 70% renewable energy in our uh, energy portfolio we will have a severe problems of managing our power system the reason is even though 70% of renewable is there if you have seen a wind power plant they are working sometime they are not working some other time the reason is the when the wind is blowing they are working when the wind is not blowing they are not working and only god knows when the wind is blowing and when the wind is not blowing of course our forecasting algorithms are now good enough to tell when the wind is blowing and when the wind is not blowing but not before days ahead we can accurately predict the wind wind in 3 to 4 hours ahead but that is not good enough to change the way we consume energy unless we have a good uh, smart metering infrastructure which can intervene and tell the people please make sure that you turn on your your washing machine from 8:30 to 9:30 where there will be lot of wind where we don't have enough load to consume that energy that kind of thing is not there uh, but that is happening in the world if you go to california there are now third party markets to manipulate people's load but in order to do that you also need to know what the people are using now there are two ways you can find out one is what we call the in- intrusive load monitoring you go into a house and try to understand what they are using now what we were trying to do is what we call non intrusive load monitoring we just wanted to get one reading the power reading and the voltage reading from the houses and may from they are extract the features and tell that what appliances are working inside that house at that particular time for that we were using first we were using signatures of all the appliances we were using 15 appliances so we developed the signatures then we trained uh, uh, ai to recognize these signatures then from there once you recognize that 
you know the 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 once you come out of that recognition phase you can now have a ai system which is trained to decompose the power and voltage signals and tell what is there in the house so we develop this uh, uh, algorithm uh, so you you use the train uh, ai then you send the voltage and so current signal which are in the bottom uh, uh, left and we had a you know sliding window and each window our decomposition algorithms will uh, look for the the trained uh, database look for the signatures and tell what is they are at, at a particular time and we had you know these 15 appliances in that particular uh, uh, house uh, and uh, that of course we managed to publish one of the the key journals in our field remember unlike uh, in medical or science uh, in engineering if you can publish in a in a journal which has an impact factor of 10 which is very high engineering 10 is very, very high good journal so this one has nine point something uh, so we you know you can see our accuracy for each time window it can very clearly say what are the combinations of appliances with the accuracy of more than 80 uh, 85 percent so which is uh, our uh, you know the supervised ai uh, did and uh, uh, of course, uh, the, we applied for a local patent for this one, still waiting for that. Then also, now with this COVID, we started working on the unsupervised AI. We are looking at the, the, the contact uh, tracing algorithms, uh, looking at vision-based. I will come back to this slide in a, in a minute later on. But basically, what we wanted to see, using the CCTV footages, can we tell that? there are possible severe contacts uh, in a particular place. And the fourth reason why AI becomes very common today is the open source codes. You don't really need to develop anything. You just go and borrow the code, get the code and run your input data on that code. And you can see that what uh, on your left hand side, what we are using is an open post key point extractor to find out the finger points of people because if it is the covid we need to make sure where what is touching somebody and the most frequent place somebody will touch is the your finger touching some uh, you know some other uh, object the on the uh, right hand side you will fire see the yolo version 4 is detecting people so these are all open source software we are not developing anything we are just tell what we want so these becomes, uh, may, uh, you know, make our life easier for one to use AI for with different applications. And you can list many applications today that can use uh, AI for rec uh, pattern recognition, generating patterns and generating anomalies, predictions, and you can name it everywhere the AI has now gone into. Okay, let me now move on to our COVID-19 related work at Peradenia. And I'm uh, happy to say that as uh, Professor Sampath Tamatunga said, uh, we are working as a team uh, and not an engineering team. We have medical and social science uh, mates working with us. We believe that research is all about teamwork. Nobody can do research alone uh, unless, uh, I mean, there are occasionally you will find some you know, researchers who work alone, alone. That is because mainly nobody else can work with them, not because that they are excellent. Uh, the, the best researchers are always work with in teams. And uh, so uh, we, I, I mean, I'm not probably boasting, the Peradenia has enormous resource of uh, multi-diversity. We don't get together, you know, like it's very hard that uh, you can find research 
you know, the research work within Peralini, where you find one from art faculty, one from medical faculty, and one from engineering faculty, very high. But we were managed to pull out this, and uh, this project is just started. Uh, okay, we are trying to struggle to start. I will come back to that in a minute. Uh, so we have a good team working on with us. Uh, I am leading the team right now. One of the things we are doing is the, the we are developing the predictive models for COVID-19. Uh, what we do is we take the post-COVID-19 data and the socio-economic variables and the geographic locations, and we are using AI forecasting model to uh, forecast the future uh, COVID-19 information. And as I told you, I am still working with the we are still working with the US data. Uh, here you can see one of our predictive model, which is a very simple two-layer uh, uh, neural network that can tell whether a particular state is, has a, you know, the low severity, very low severity, moderate severity, or very high severity. So that is what it gives out. So you can see that then the you know the New York came out with a high severity, obviously with the uh, the data that we have and the demographic information and also we look at the various correlation between various demographic information on these uh, outputs and also you can see here we took three uh, uh, states and uh, we develop our prediction models and you can see towards the end uh, from uh, uh, 13 8 onward we are running our prediction model together with the known data we have and you can see that there is a very good correlation our ai can predict the the future uh, covid cases pretty closer to the actual cases so that's uh, uh, another piece of work we do and also, as I told you, we have look. We are looking for contact hotspot, which are vulnerable. Uh, particularly looking at the factory environments, uh, where there could be a lot of contact hotspots, uh, which are ch challenging to locate. Remember, we you we are using uh, CCTV footages, and they are 2D view, and they are not 2D view looking like that direction. They are looking at some of you know, obscure direction. So we need to generate exact 3D information from that 2D footage. So that is what we are trying to do. But remember, as I told you, we are not developing any tools. The tools are out there. So the, the one tool we are using is the key point extractor, which can tell, we can, you can see that you, it can very correctly figure out the, the where the fingers are. But the problem is, we using the CCTV footage, you don't know whether a particular person is closer to another person because you don't have that depth information. So we use a manicure challenge depth uh, estimator to look at the depth. And once you put two together, you should be able to work out whether a finger is touching or not. Now it is like using a, uh, your, uh, we, the, the visual uh, images doing this using one you know one camera is difficult but that's the that's the challenge we will have because in a factory you only have cctv footages and if you if a particular person became covid positive and if you wanted to find out in past 10 day, 10 days what are the active contacts he or she had you need to use the CCTV footages. Of course, you can talk to him and get some information, but uh, CCTV footages are there right, right through the, uh, the day the factory will be recording them. So you go back to those footages, run these algorithms and see whom that particular person had direct contact during the, the active period. That is what we wanted to find out. Then that can minimize the test. Right now, you just find out people, bring 300 people and do PCR test and then, you know, it is, I mean, the PCR test is a cost to the government. It's not uh, come uh, free. So you need to, if you can optimize the PCR steps, uh, test while randomly doing few, I think that is the best. So that is what we are trying to do. 
the next one is the computer vision for identify social distancing violations again we are using uh, you know uh, one software to locate the people you can see that this software is pretty good in locating uh, uh, people the boxes indicate people then we use we will look at the uh, video footage and look at how the we these people are moving and see whether it's a family or friends coming together all the way now if it, if that is the case of course you know that they have been together before also they so they are not a risky uh, encounter but if we are coming with a case where you have a footage where in this footage if you look at like these red spots where there are many people moving around and if we can really work out using our uh, you know the touch estimator that there were you know the contacts and then you know if they if we found that one day there was a covid positive case on one of those places you can easily locate the, uh, the uh, now remember in our uh, even though i am showing you some of the figures you cannot uh, find out uh, faces in in our research what we are doing is we are converting these people into a skeleton structure but for this presentation i thought the skeleton wouldn't, wouldn't be that nice so that is why i came up with the pictures because nobody can recognize anybody there and obviously this is uh, i think somewhere in oxford no none of us knows who is there at oxford so that's perfectly all right but whenever we are using our data we first convert the this the, the the people into skeletons skeleton in the sense not the medical skeletons just you know some okay this is uh, coming back to this project uh, this is a, a new project that we got from uh, canadian uh, like we were selected for canadian funding uh, this is where the team was put up uh, the artificial intelligence framework for threat assessment and containment for covid-19 and future epidemics while mitigating the socio economic impact to women children and underprivileged groups and uh, and you can very clearly see that this guy is an engineer he doesn't know what what is uh, socio economic impact that's why we have sociology and the, uh, you know we don't know much about covid-19 that's why we have covid experts we are uh, the hardcore uh, ai experts we we'll, we only do that part of the job and that is where the real uh, uh, i mean they uh, you i'll show you they have only selected uh, seven project from the world to fund and uh, i'm sure they have seen the strength of the group otherwise they wouldn't uh, uh you know select as and it is basically university of peradeniya uh uniten is university of tanaga in malaysia but they are only leading they will have they have many other universities in malaysia and the uh, institute of policy studies here of course i'm going not going to go into the objectives uh, this is basically the work packages we have we have uh, comprehensive data collection uh, work we will be collect uh, past behavior patterns present behavior patterns collision data and socio economic and uh, demographic data that will go into our ai systems but of course you need to validate the data you need to arrange the data to be used with our ai system and the ai uh, will give us output such as impact study collision emulation emulation spatial temporal forecasting uh susceptibility of each group contact tracing uh, tra strategies and threat level assessment and then in the last work package we wanted to uh talk to our stakeholders and uh, fine tune our ai and then inform the policy how what is the best containment strategy for particular socio economic group now remember uh, right now we don't really consider uh, you know the the many many factors all we are doing is blanket we just uh, lock down a area but if we can uh, you know go into more detail and as you know like in malaysia they have four bands and these bands they use different uh, ways of uh, uh, 
containing different areas. Uh, and you, as I, you can see that uh, the, they have selected seven uh, research groups for this project. We are the only group from Asia. Um, and uh, tonight, I, you know, directly after this, I have to go online for the inception workshop of this project. Uh, but uh, I think I must uh, request the help of the, the UGC because we are st stuck with this circular. Um, I must thank the Vice Chancellor. Uh, he, I got received the grant agreement on 14th October, and uh, we went through all the legal bodies within the university and submitted to the UGC on 24th October. And UGC was pretty quick, I must tell you, even though it was locked down, uh, Shamika was very helpful and pushed it through to the ministry. But now it is hanging around in ministries and uh, many days and I'm very much like upset to go to the inception workshop tonight with our, because we still can't even think of when we are going to sign this agreement. So I think the SRAS has, a, you know, we need to, as SRAS, we need to do a big deliberation because the research will not move forward if this, uh, like, I can see the, the essence of the circular, but for the research, we are working with global community. And as uh, uh, Professor Sampath very correctly said, we are looking at in the global bunch. And if we are going to stagnate like this due to, a, uh, you know, the, I, I don't, I'm not blaming anybody, but it is the typical system that we have. Uh, now, what happened was the, this agreement went into foreign affairs. They came up with some comments, but these are international bodies, and I send it to the international body. They say, okay, you can't, you can't do it. Then I had to send it back to now foreign affairs. Now foreign affairs has to come back and tell me what to do next. So it's a bit of a, you know, the, the deadlock right now. Uh, so I think as researchers, we must, deliberate make a deliberation on this particular aspect otherwise i mean you know like i can see these figures that professor sampath Tamatunga is telling as collectively what is happening in each and every university but also we need to remember that each and every university has few very active researchers who has been contributing to the figures that you are showing whereas there are so many who are sleeping and people like us who has been, you know, very active doing research, and um, I'm glad that I'm also in that top 2% list now. Uh, uh, you know, we are really get frustrated when, you know, something that is beyond our, uh, you know, this is not what I'm supposed to do, but I, I have to phone these people every day and say, what's happening? So it's a bit of a, you know, so I think, uh, you know, I thought that this is some, point where I must uh, use my keynote to uh, point this out so that we, as a research community, we can get out and tell the, uh, you know, the authorities, please, uh, you know, we need to do something. So in conclusion, uh, as I told you, artificial intelligence is emergent uh, as a powerful tool, not because of uh, main, uh, one reason, many reasons, the improved computing power, uh, open source tools, uh, many different algorithms come, you know, developed by computer uh, specialists. Uh, and uh, we are at Peradenia, we have been working predominantly on uh, AI application on engineering side. But uh, with this COVID, we moved on to COVID related uh, activities and we put up this team and we started uh, working on the, uh, the COVID related application and I that is where I think it fits into this theme because I feel I consider it an, as an innovation. Uh, we are, you know, we never bother to talk to other people and put up a proposal like this. Uh, and we are now working on the pandemic models and vision based AI uh, and computer vision for uh, social distancing identification. And I believe that with the recent grant we got, uh, it's a two-year grant, uh, we should be able to inform the policy in a better way using our AI tools. Thank you very much for your uh, 
time.